Hi, everyone. My name is Jeff Starr, and this is my channel, Not Bad Films. I uh, am really super honored and excited today to be uh, doing an interview with Vidushi Mita Nag, who is a world-renowned sitarist from the Vishnupur Gorana. For those who have not previously seen any of my interviews, uh, please be aware that I am still a student of Indian classical music, and I may get some things wrong or have some, some basic questions or, or have some trouble with pronunciation. And uh, Mita G, I would, of course, ask you to feel free to jump in and correct me uh, so that I can learn from those mistakes and that other students like myself can avoid making those mistakes in, in, their, um, in their journey. So you hail from the uh, Vishnupur Garana. Vishnupur, yeah. That's, Vishnu, Vishnu is in a Lord Vishnu. Okay. So it's one of the three, the trinity. It's, it's like we have Brahma and Vishnu and then Maheshwar, who is Lord Shiva. So he's one of the gods of the trinity. So Vishnu is also Krishna, Lord Krishna. Yes. He is the preserver. And the town is actually a worshipper of Vishnu's deity. So it's known as Vishnupur. Okay. In Bengal, we call it B, B Vishnupur. Vishnupur, okay. Yeah. So the Vishnupur Garana. Now, as a sitar student, and I think a lot of maybe Westerners who are, are learning about Indian classical music may be more familiar with the Mayahar or the Atawa Garanas. What is about um, uh, Vishnupur, how would you summarize it as a sort of what makes it different or unique? Uh, actually, Vishnupur, Vishnupur is a very ancient Garana about nearly 4, 450 years old. And it's it's older than it was. It's older than my heart, and uh, it has a very very rich heritage set in historical times, almost since the time when the Mughal Empire began to decline. Mm. And although the names of the most famous musicians of Bishnupur, like we, we learn about them, like they were there from the 18th century and early 19th century, early 20th century. But Bishnupur had a very, very rich culture. Like it could be around the 8th century or the 9th century AD. Since then, wow. like Bishnupur was there, actually the kings, the royal families there, they were warriors. And they used to call them the Malhas, the Malla. The Mallas are actually wrestlers. And they were warriors. They were the tenants. They were the tenants in some ways of the Mughal, the Muslim rulers. But later on, they also fought against these rulers to claim their sovereignty. And they wanted to preserve their religion there. And they wouldn't just yield to the Mughal uh, rulers. And they didn't want themselves to get converted. Mm. So they just uh, adhered. They just kept strictly, strictly to their religion, which is like Hinduism. And Hinduism in the sense of that at that time, like when Bishnupur town existed, there a lot of pilgrims used to come from the north, from Brindavan, the time when this Gharana started. And so they used to come and they used to visit this town while en route to, you know, Orissa, Lord Jagannath's temple in Puri. Many musicians at that time who were disintegrating because of the, like the, the, the Mughal empire was disintegrating and these, these musicians were, they were fleeing the empire to, to seek their livelihood in different, all the sub states in wow. all these, like yeah, the, the Zamindars and all the smaller kings. So on their way, all these musicians, they used to stop over at Bishnupur and spend a few days before they traveled further to the southeast of India, to Puri, or maybe to the southern part of India, and also to the north. And Bishnupur being a very rich town, they hosted and they patronized these musicians. And that mm -hmm. is how gradually, like, 
this Bishnupur town had become a center of music. I shouldn't say that originally it was only the pure Drupad or classical music, but the influence of the Vaishnav Kirtan, you know, the Kirtan is actually sure. a song, yes, which is sung in, like, it evokes Lord Krishna and it talks about the myths, the legends of Lord Krishna. Here in Bishnupur town, the Kirtan was also very popular, but later on, slowly, all the classical musicians, they came and started settling here. They used to come and rest here for a few days, and that is how Dhrupad music started in Bishnupur. It was sometimes in the late 18th century that there was a king called Raghunath Shingha the second, and it was during his reign that a certain uh, Drupad singer Bahadur Shen, who was a descendant of Tan Shen along his daughter's line, mm -hmm. he had come to Vishnupur, and the king requested him to stay in Vishnupur as the court musician and to teach the local people there. And slowly, that is how from there, the Dhrupad music started, it grew, and the local people, they became the disciples of Bahadur Sen. And gradually from there, the Gharana started. Would you say that that um, because of that that influence or, or just its development, that there's uh, certain ragas that are then associated with it or are sort of unique or specific to that Gharana? Yes, I think there's a very much uh, like religious influence on this Gharana because the Kirtan songs that are sung uh, to worship Lord Krishna, most of these songs were actually written in the Drupad verse and they were also sung in that style. Uh -huh. Later on, many like folk and country elements like were added to it. But previously, the Kirtan followed the Drupad style of singing. And the Drupad style is a very original style of mm -hmm. song in India. Like this is the original format of classical music. Khyal came in later after the invasion of the Persian and the Mughal rulers. Previous to that, we had the Drupad form of singing. I was just going to ask, sort yes. of, and I apologize for interrupting. And in sort of the way, then that you know that that Drupad influence is obviously so is so much of the foundation of the Gharana. Is that then that is Drupad a big uh, aspect into the way the performance is then sort of in, in a modern era, the way you approach it? Yes, of course, because uh, what now that. Whatever we play, like in, in the sitar or any other instrument, uh, previously in Bishnupur, the most important musical instruments were the Rudraveena and the Surbahar. Mm. And later on, uh, quite a degree of the Khyal influence and the influence of the sitar baj, baj style, the sitar baj, that was also introduced in Bishnupur because uh, all the musicians, the gurus, the teachers from different gharanas, they used to come to Bishnupur because it was a very, very prosperous town at that time. And they used to perform. And that is how the disciples and the uh, learners who were in Bishnupur, they also started playing the sitar. So it was actually an assimilated style. Like it had... Drupad, and also with that, it had the sitar, the special style that is played on the instrument, the sitar. Mm -hmm. I mean, the compositions, the Masid Khani and the Reza Khani compositions. And the disciples, they also learned from other gharanas, like they learned from the, the Benares gharana. And they also learned later on from the Lucknow gharana. Okay. And 
They also learned from other gharanas from the western part of the country. So actually you see that this gharana, when it grew and it flourished, it saw the influence of many other gharanas. But these musicians, you know, they assimilated all the styles in such a beautiful way that Bishnupur had an expression, a style, peculiarly its own. And also they tried to look into the ragas in their own way. Oh. And some of the ragas, they were very much specific to this gharana. Like the ragas had the same name as in the northern or the western gharanas, but the approach was different. Like they tried to explain everything in their way, own way from their own point of view. And so long as the alap is played, we still strictly follow the Drupad style in the alap format. In the exposition mm. part of the raga, we strictly follow the Drupad style till okay. this day. Okay. Th this is this is fantastic information. <laughs> I'm loving this. After we have formed the foundation of our style, which is the Garana. That is what I've learned from my father and also a bit of it from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So the basic style, the foundation, all the compositions and the approach to the rhythm, to the tabla part of it, that is all what you learn. But after that, after you, you have matured and after you are listening to a lot of good music around you, so you learn to imbibe, mm. like taking some of the best parts from the others and trying to assimilate them so that your style being within your gharana can stand out as an individual expression. Yeah. It's just not a copycat. <laughs> so this, yeah, so there should be an individual expression. And you know, I have, when I play, like in my rendition, I always have, of course, some set compositions in mind. But then after that, whatever I play, it's going to be different every time I play because I'm playing very spontaneously. Yeah. Apart from like maybe 30% of it is just set composition and the rest 70% is just what I'm playing on spot spontaneously. I don't know like what is going to come today. <laughs> so it's just like a sports. Yeah. Like you are there with the cricket bat or you are there with the football in your uh, like leg, but you don't know how it's going to be today. What's going to be the result of the game? The sitar has different uh, limitations than a voice does, right? A, a vocalist can, can easily go up or down with their pitch, but as a, as a sitarist on a, on a string fretted instrument, you can only bend up. You can only hit your mean to go up or you could, um, you know, bend that string in advance and, and release it to lower your pitch, but you sort of need to, um, you need to know where you're going to sort of know where to start. And my question for you is when you're improvising, how do you plan for that instrument's limitation and how do you work around it? Yes, like the style of sitar that we play. So this is actually, you know, the Itwa Gharana, has a different style of sitar, especially since Ustad Vilayat Khan's style. Yes. They have the six string sitar, the Gandhar Panchan. Yep. But this is actually the sitar with two bass strings, the Kharaj or the Sharaj and the Pancham. So these are the bronze strings and they are tuned in the very low octave. So on our kind of sitar, actually, we have, we can access three and a half octaves. Wow. The very low, the low, the middle, and till I think pancham or dhaivat in the high octave. Maximum we can sound clear is the till pa or ta. Now, Whatever we play, whether it's the Khyal style or whether it's the Drupad style that we imbibe on our instrument, 
The instrument definitely has certain limitations. Every kind of instrument has its own limitations <laughs> compared to the song because the song, you know, the the your body and the voice is your instrument and you can mold your voice the way you feel. But here actually your body, your fingers have to adapt to the instrument yeah. to give expression to your inner song. But whatever you play, the song is there. You have to sing within and you have to know the technique, the art of expressing the song. So now this is a strumming instrument. We call it the Tantra Vadya. In the Tantra Vadya or the string instrument, the right hand plays a very important role, the bowls, where we break the syllables. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are playing the alap, of course, we have to play the mirrors. So there, you should have a very, very good jawari with a medium close sound so that the sustenance is there when you play the mirrors. And in addition to the mirrors, we also have a number of alamkars. Like we have in Dhrupad, of course, you can't play very, very fast mirrors when you are playing the alap. They have to be deep and long mirrors like the Surbahar or like the Veena. Yeah. And then also like the mirrors have to be very smooth and rolling and round. Mm. So the sustenance of the Jawari is very important in this case. Yeah, I would and imagine. <laughs> sometimes, yes, and sometimes also we need to break up notes. Like you have to very, very subtly switch over from one fret to the other fret to take a long mirror. Suppose mm. I want to play something like so Satu Pa, it's very difficult to play the mirror. So what I do is like very subtly, I move over to the fret ray and I slide. So sa. Okay, so these subtleties, the musician has to be very witty and also <laughs> he or she has to adapt like spontaneously and momentarily has to just think and produce the kind of subtlety, the ornament yeah. required for that particular effect. Because and whatever we are playing, you know, inside we are continuously singing. And it's happening almost simultaneously. Like the singing and the playing, they are happening almost simultaneously. It's a sort of reflex. Whatever mm -hmm. we are contemplating, immediately it's just, it's something, you know, like driving. Yeah. It's like driving. Like you can see the road and you know which way to steer. Yeah. So it's very much like that. It has to be very, very spontaneous. The reflex has to go like your mind and your body. They should coordinate very, very harmoniously. Getting to that point of, of in, you know, of, of having that smoothness of thought, right? To know where you're playing. I obviously a huge portion of that is going to just be all the time spent practicing and the guidance that you're getting through your, your guru and your teacher. But in, in your case in learning, was that supplemented by studying vocal music or, or learning on other instruments that would maybe expose you to different ways of, of thinking about the music? Actually, when I was a kid, I used to learn dancing in addition to sitar playing. I had learned Kathak dance till I was 10 years old. Okay. Because, you know, for a child, the dance, the dance is attractive. It's also very rhythmic. It's also a kind of playful sport. Yes. So like my parents wanted me to start with dancing because it also, you know, builds up in you the sense of the rhythm. Mm-hmm. 
and since my childhood almost like i was from from the moment i was born i was listening to music in my family and somehow like unconsciously the music the the tone of classical music the 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 scales the ragas i was listening to them since my birth and i was absorbing everything unconsciously so like it it just got into me like that i didn't have to consciously learn anything the music just it entered me since the time i was born because i was continuously listening to my grandfather to my father mm -hmm. who were then like they my father was in his prime time my grandfather wasn't really performing at that time because he had given up stage performance at a, at a quite an early age okay. in his late 60s but then he was singing all the time my grandfather used to sing all the time all through the day he was just humming 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 the the different ragas so his voice you could just hear reverberating throughout the house and oh, of course that. he was also playing the sitar i also saw him playing the rudraveena you know casually he used to play the rudraveena sure. he had the rudraveena he was also playing sometimes the harmonium and when teaching his students he was also supporting giving them the tabla support like he used to sit with the sitar and the tabla and when the students they used to play the compositions he used to just give them the support on the tabla i even saw my dad giving that support on the tabla when some student was playing so i grew up into a totally <laughs> musical atmosphere i love this and i used to sing i didn't have any formal singing like lesson sure. but whatever i used to play my father just asked me to sing it aloud because he said that when you sing you know that exact pitch it you 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 learn that exact pitch and when you sing like you can remember it and you can feel the notes much more stronger and then you are able to play so sing and remember and then play so internalizing the music through singing and again expressing it through your instrument that is how actually we learned and we grew up learning in that way it's not always that my father was teaching me like he was sitting in front of me it was not always a formal teaching but even when you are around and you are listening to the students learning and your like father or grandfather singing that was also a kind of indirect learning that is also a form of indirect learning yeah yeah i i i grew up my my father is a musician um he, he's a jazz trumpet player and my whole life it's just been listening to him practice you know like and whether he was teaching students or he was practicing him, him for himself um you know that's that in the background or him you know listening to music or something like that's mm -hmm. this is huge foundation to from from the moment i've been born you know i just want to ask a little bit about your mom because it was my understanding that she was also a musician or had some musical background did she help my mom your education yes. yes my mom is an exceptional person in that she sacrificed everything for the family because she is a very intelligent woman and she was very good in studies and as in her teens she started learning sitar from my grandfather oh and later on from my father and that is how my father fell in love with her <laughs> and you know in those times like uh, arranged marriages were more common rather than nowadays the two they know each other but yeah. so she couldn't he couldn't say directly to my mom that i love you but you know what he did is he went straight to my maternal grandmother and he told about his proposal to my grandmother <laughs> now it so happened my grandmother was very fond of her would be son in law from the very beginning my my father was very very modest very honest very handsome <laughs> and very caring and so like both of them started exchanging letters like 
Letter after letter, my father oh, kept it. on writing to my grandmother and she replied. And maybe after five years of courtship, not to my mom, but to my grandmother, <laughs> this marriage was finalized. But oh, in wow. between, my yeah, my mom was meeting my father. She was learning from my grandfather. Okay, but no, they never discussed marriage because... <laughs> That was left to, to the grandmother, to, to my course. mom's mom. And like, whatever about marriage, she was talking with my dad, not my mom. <laughs> <laughs> this and, is, uh, I love this. And then my mother, you know, of course, she became a member of the Nag family. But because my father had a very, very hectic and very busy professional life, and so... I was a kid and mm. after 10 years, my brother was born So, and we were a joint family with my grandmother, my, my paternal grandfather, grandmother, my aunts. So it was a joint family. And, you know, in, in, in the middle class uh, Indian and Bengali family, the, the women, they have to. And when the new, when the woman comes into the family as the new bride, so she has to shoulder much of the responsibility. Yeah. And in that way, my mom, she became, in a sense, just the housewife. And she didn't find that time to practice, but she could play really well. She hmm. had learned well, she had practiced hard, and she could play well. And sometimes, like when my mom and my father, they were playing together, and somebody was listening to them from outside, they really couldn't distinguish like who was playing. Wow. She played so well. But then ultimately, she gave up. And now, like... She, even today, like she is there looking after the household, managing everything. But sometimes, you know, she feels very sad that she she just couldn't carry on with her talents. But she feels very proud that at least I have, like I have carried out whatever she had wished. Her yeah. dreams, I have made it come true because she wanted to see her dreams come true through me. And, and you've obviously learned, you know, so much from your dad. I'm just sort of curious, like, what are some of the important lessons that he, he taught you, music or otherwise? Like music, I learned entirely from him. So I didn't have a second guru. My father is my only guru. Mm -hmm. Although I have listened to many, many musicians, senior musicians of his time, and uh, my father, he used to suggest that I listen more to vocal music rather than instrumental. Oh, interesting. Because listening to vocal music builds up in you that improvisational sense, like how to improvise. And he mm -hmm. also asked me to listen to a lot of Dhrupad music at that time. Like he asked me to listen to the senior Dagger brothers because he was also very, very fond of their singing. And when he was young and they used to, the Dagger, the senior Dagger brothers used to be in Calcutta. He used to go in the evening to their residence and used to listen to their songs. Apart from like his own learning from my grandfather, yeah. who was also a very, very, like, uh, uh, competent Drupad singer. And at one time, you know, in, around the 1930s, when the Calcutta radio station used to broadcast live from Gustin's place in in. Esplanade, at that time, the station, the, the, the broadcast station wasn't in the place where it is now, but it was in Gustin's place. Mm -hmm. And there was no recorded, pre-recorded session, but it was all a direct live session. My grandfather used to sing in one session and play the sitar in another broadcast oh, session. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So my father always uh, advised me to listen to the songs. And regarding other instruments, he was a great admirer of Pandit Nikhil Banerjee, who was about eight years senior to my Baba. Okay. And also he loved Ustad Ali Akbar Khan Sahib. Like it was not the matter of a gharana. 
because my father had never been a very, very rigid or kind of conformist to any gharana. And even Bishnupur gharana is not a very rigid gharana. Hmm. Bishnupur gharana has taken all the liberty to assimilate the best from different gharanas and to give it a voice of its own. In that way, my father said, well, the gharana is actually, it's the root. It's the foundation. So you have to learn all the technique, the style of your gharana. But when you listen to great masters, irrespective of whatever gharanas they belong to, you know, you build up that aesthetic sense within you, which is very, very important for a beautiful art. Mm. And it is Ustad Ali Akbar Khan and with Pandit Nikhil Banerjee, like the sitar and the sarod that they played, that my father said, you just listen to their music and you just try to feel the music. Mm. You retain the style of your own gharana, but you just try to feel, you just try to feel their aesthetic supremacy, their aesthetic perfection. And the more you listen to them, you will know how, how to better yourself. Because it's always a process. Is It's a continuous process of learning and growing. Music, you can never say, well, I have ended up here. I know I know how to play now. No, Indian music is not like that. It's so deep. Like the more you just proceed, you see the horizon is expanding. The vista is always expanding. So even like when you are a mature artist, even at a ripe old age, you know that no, there's still infinite things that you could, you haven't achieved in one life. Mm. Indian music is so vast that I think for no musician, it's possible to achieve everything of this music in one life. No, there are yeah. music musicians like who have perfected it to their greatest and highest ability. But even they would say, no, we know nothing of it. <laughs> you know, it's this humility. It's yeah. <laughs> this sense of wonder. Huh? It's the sense of the endlessness, the infinity of uh, the the quality of the, the this music and yeah. there are infinite possibilities and you cannot play to perfection all the ragas in one lifetime it's not, not possible that's not possible it's but, unthinkable so my father that is how like he and the other thing is he used to sit with me and sometimes he used to he never taught me like that okay secluded from the other students i'm teaching you very privately no mm -hmm. he used to call me in his classroom along with the other disciples. And sometimes if somebody was learning Raga Yemen, he asked me to pick up my sitar and play Raga Yemen. Whatever he or she was playing, I was playing the same thing. Oh, I love it. If somebody was learning Rag Malkos, okay, come, you learn Rag Malkos. So oh, he never taught me separately. After all, he didn't have the time because he was a very busy artist and almost like for 20 or 25 days a month, he wasn't at home. Wow. So whenever he was at home, he was teaching. All the students used to come and flock. So he didn't really have any extra time to teach me. So I learned along with all his other disciples while his class was going on. And I remember it was not until his 50s that he really found some time, like when he was not playing so many concerts and I had grown up and I was in the college. It was around that time that he found some time to sit with me along with the tabla player. There were many renowned tabla players who used to drop in at our house to practice with him. And he used to make me sit with the tabla players. And along with him, I was just like a supporting musician. Whatever he was playing, I just had to play after him. <laughs> <laughs> like I was just like the sarangi or the harmonium accompanying the main musician in the yeah. song. So he was playing, I was following. He was playing, I was following. And sometimes he, he would just get up and just walk around and say, okay, now you practice with the tabla, try to play some tehais. Okay, start playing the tan and don't stop for two minutes. 
Uh-huh. You play in this speed and keep on playing the khan for two minutes. And after maybe one minute, my hand, you know, was going numb. At <laughs> yeah, that speed, totally. I couldn't play. Yes, <laughs> my arm was paining and my hand, my nerves, they were going numb. <laughs> no, 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 you, you can't stop. You can't stop. And so everything got then jumbled up and I stopped. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and the tabla player used to start laughing and say, Oh, Moni Da, why are you just giving so much punishment to your daughter? She's so obedient. <laughs> and I couldn't utter a word. I never protested because I was also very determined and I was a very headstrong kind of a girl. Okay, okay, I have to do it. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give in. I have to do it. Yes. I have to achieve it. So the more, like he told me, the more stubborn I grew. And this is how actually, you know, when you practice like that, so you get that strength to play, that dynamism to play. Mm -hmm. And that is how you actually grow. You mature and you ripen. There's like the sort of trial by fire or something, you know, to, yes, you have to yes. rise to that occasion. And it, it, it really, to what your point, it, it helps you grow a lot in those, in a short amount of time, I think. With my father, like touring with him, being with him, I have learned how to look at life. Mm. That is what he taught me, like how to look at life. He told me, don't take life very seriously. Mm. You know, don't take life very seriously. Just do what comes along your path. Just remember one thing. You have to be very, very self-supporting. Don't depend on anyone for anything. And that is why, you know, I'm also a teacher. I'm teaching in a high school in Kolkata. So I have parallel professions, music and teaching. So he wanted me to take up this job because being a woman, being an Indian woman, he very much felt that I should have a very strong foot on the ground and that I should be very, very self-supporting. And mm. at that point in my life, he wasn't sure that how much famous or how much successful I would become as a female musician. Mm -hmm. But later on, when I wanted to give up my job, I just wanted to do music. My mother said, no, no, keep that job. So long as you can play your music, it's, it's not coming in your way. You can go for tours. And in that way, you know, my workplace, they are very liberal. And they also, they have a respect for my music and my family. And they allow me these, these special opportunities or the privileges that I get when I'm playing. They, they allow me that space to participate in concerts mm. and to go out on tours. So he used to say, be self-supporting. And the other thing, and a very, very philosophical approach, he said, look, life is full of conflicts. Life is not always success. Life is not always joyful. But you know, like creation, you are a creation of nature. And creation means bliss. It's a blessing. Mm that you are a life born on earth. And it is, you are blessed by nature to be born, to see the beauty of nature. So no matter whatever comes in the way of your life, never lose that inner joy inside you, the ananda, yeah. live in joy. And so I was just remembering uh, this this book by the poet, the U.S. poet Robert Bly, the soul is here for its own joy. <laughs> that is what my father taught me. And he said, just be with your music. Everything else is going to fade away. But as long as your music is there, music is going to be your greatest company in life. When When I think about sort of that, improvisational sort of experience and knowing how much of that ability of course comes through years of practice and, and to be able to be prepared to think and translate it to your hand um, and to to bring that individuality out um, I think about how the process of learning has probably changed a lot from what you're describing as your experience to let's say a modern day experience mm -hmm. um, especially Western students or people who are sort of just dipping a toe into Indian music. They want to learn one raga this week and another thing the next week. Mm. 
what was your that time frame for you in learning? It sounds like you're from being a child to your college years, it was just this constant absorption of music and mm. sitting in on a lesson here and sitting in on another lesson another day and having to piece all that together. Can you just sort of talk about what that experience was like for you for yourself to to one day sort of was there a realization like oh I sort of know all this stuff or was it like or was it you were told okay you can now play everything <laughs> no I was never told like that that now you can play everything no nobody around me neither my father nor my mom they never told me okay now you are ready to go up on stage yeah like I... it was a very natural process of growing and of becoming very unconsciously. Because in my family, like it's a family of musicians. So I was always listening to different musicians and I was also going to different concerts along with my father. Sometimes as a kid, I used to accompany him on the Tanpura. And I used to play maybe one or two concerts, but my dad never allowed me to play in too many concerts till I was really able to play well. Hmm. And in the beginning, as I told you, this is a special, I think, being growing within the family of a musician gives you this special privilege of sitting on the stage with your guru. Yeah. So like initially, you know, just to train me up to the approach of the stage, my dad used to just make me sit along with him in the concert and I used to play with him. Sometimes little by little, he used to just give me little spaces within his playing and ask me to play. And if ever like I was just going away somewhere, like I was moving away from his route. He used to just take up from there and he used to keep playing. He used to look at me like that. And I knew, okay, I, I, I'm just moving away from maybe his route. And again, I used to catch up with him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was a very natural process of training, almost the same way that a kid gets trained by its mother. Mm. No, it's just growing and learning. So it's a, a, an unconscious process of learning. It's a part of your daily living. It's not something special that, okay, I am learning a music. I'm learning sitar, nothing like that. It's a very natural process of learning. And I hardly remember like how and when exactly I became fit to play as a soloist. I don't exactly remember. <laughs> and when I was practicing a raga, maybe one raga, I, I was practicing and I was practicing the same raga for many days. One thing came very naturally to me. I don't know, because maybe that was in my genes, like the frets. So whenever I was switching over from one raga to the other raga, the frets came very naturally to me. Like there was hardly any misnoting. Mm. That I could do. Like a cleanliness like, to your playing? Sometimes, you know, when you are a learner here, you know, you have to get used to the scales. Yeah. And you may misnote very often. But one thing I remember, my father used to say that I have a very, very good reflex. That's what he used to say. And uh, I'm confessing to you that even today, like I really haven't got the time to practice for 10 or 12 hours. Because <laughs> I had to do my academics, my studies and my music. So, you know, it was a 50-50 share. So yeah. if I could practice one day for five hours, that was something great. Sure. But my dad said that I had a good reflex and that I could pick up very fast and I didn't miss note. Hmm. That is one thing very positive about me. He had noticed in me and maybe that was just my genes or I grew, I was born, I, was, I grew up with that. Yeah. And learning was not very difficult for me in that way. I find so much joy in the sound of mm. the music that it comes. It comes from within me very naturally. Is is there a is there a, a rag that's 
your favorite to listen to? I'm fond of so many ragas. I, I can't say, well, this is a <laughs> rag that I'm specially fond of. No. Yeah. And any rag that is played beautifully by any maestro, it moves me. I have listened to, I think, one of the best Bhim Palasi renditions that I have heard in vocal is by Pandit Rajan Mishra, who just left Mm. As a few months ago, you know, he succumbed to yeah. the pandemic, the COVID-19 virus. And that was one of the best Bhim Palazi. And even a few days earlier, I was just listening to another very beautiful Bhim Palazi by this uh, Mahara- the Maharashtrian vocalist. She's a lady, Ashwini Bhireji. It's okay. a beautiful Bhim Palazi. And the other Bhim Palasi I will never forget is a duet by our very, very legendary Asha Bhosleji, who is the sister of Lata Mangeshkarji, who just, you know, this very, very famous playback singer, she just passed away a yeah. few weeks before. So her sister, Asha Bhosleji, she has a duet. She took some lessons from Ustad Ali Akbar Khan. She has a duet where uh, Khan Sahab is playing the Sarod and she is singing. Mm. That's also a very, very beautiful Bhim Palazi composition. I'll remember Ahir Lalit by Pandit Ravi Shankar. Ahir Lalit, I love that. Yeah. And also, I... Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> it's modern technology. For Maybe for, the, for a rag like Abhogi, I would... Love to listen to Ustad Amir Khan Sahib's vocal, the khayal mm. in Rag Abhogi or Bageshri or Marwa. So I like Ustad Amir Khan Sahib's khayal because, you know, his khayal, he showed us a very, very different path from the normal khayal. And it's a go between the Drupad and the khayal. And his style, I think, Pandit Nikhil Banerjee, imbibed the vocal style of Ustad Amir Khan and he played so beautiful Allah mm. because he was imbibing Ustad Amir Khan's style. It's a very, very subtle, subtle way of perceiving a rag. With music students or with sitar students, what do you see as a common mistake that those students make? Hmm. I think for the kids, it's not the mistake that they make, but their guardians. Oh, okay. Because you know, kids, kids are always like they are guided by their guardians. But mm-hmm. it's mostly their parents who come with a kind of like making them artists very soon, very fast. Yeah. Like they want, <laughs> yes, they are just very, very eager to see their kids on the stage (laughs) but they don't understand that playing an instrument like the sitar learning it and being able to perfect it would need much time like the duration it should be a long time that they need to devote if we think of the early maestros and their gurus like the gurus like Baba Alauddin or maybe say for example my grandfather or the great maybe Ustad Vilayat Khan Saad's father, they Mm -hmm. would have never allowed their disciples to play on stage before they really came to that perfection. They arrived at that point of perfection when they could just go up and play on the stage. But now guardians, because I think it's an influence of the social media. (laughs) <laughs> you have this sure. Facebook, the Instagram, the YouTube channel. So every, like every father or every mother, they are very keen to see their kids performing on the social media <laughs> and getting like lots of applauses from their friends and relatives and maybe from even strangers. Maybe. Yeah. And also there is a kind of illusion about getting rewards. Mm. prizes like okay my kid he is just going to appear for the school contest so somewhere there's the school contest going on in maybe instrumental music and the mom is very hopeful okay my kid is going to come out first (laughs) so this is actually this this is something which hinders the learning process 
Mm-hmm. Because if you are always looking forward that it's like a match, it's like a contest and mm-hmm. someone has to be successful and it's got to be a showbiz, then the process of learning is hampered. It gets yeah. stuck somewhere. Because learning is something and presenting is something. And in order to present well, you must have a very, very solid foundation. And to to have that foundation strong, you have to devote that time for learning. Mm. They see the musician on the stage and they, they are very eager, like they are curious to learn. And they think that, okay, the musician is playing like this. Let me get a sitar and I think I can hold it and I can play. (laughs) And now that they start learning, they realize how difficult it is to master the instrument. And there are so many people, they give up maybe in a few months. They realize, no, I'm not going to be able to play like him or her on the stage. It's not possible. It's difficult. And then the disillusionment point starts. They start getting disillusioned. Oh, for sure. I know with myself as as a sitar student, there was a point where I was feeling very disillusioned with just... You know, uh, you know, I'm in my 40s. Where am I going with this? You know, I'm never going to reach a certain level. And then realizing that, like, that was the wrong way to think about it. It was to remember that I was doing this because I loved learning and getting a better understanding and a different perspective. And that actually really allowed me to feel a lot freer and to to enjoy the process, you know, and enjoy the struggle a lot, you know, because I think sometimes people just their hand hurts or they get frustrated because they can't build up speed and, and, and that sort of um, shift in, in thinking for me at least was, was really helpful. What would advice would you give to a student now to be able to make their practice session, which may not be 10 hours, but may only be 30 minutes or, yes. or, or, or an hour if they're lucky or only 15 mm-hmm. minutes to make that as productive as possible. Yeah. The, 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 most uh, like shortest advice would be like a student is learning something. So drilling is very important. Like once he picks up a composition, maybe a gut, I have noticed that after they have learned the composition, they can play the composition part nicely because it's just memorized. Mm -hmm. But when they are playing the mirrors, the thans, the saparts, or the very, very like strong bowls, that is where they are faltering. Mm. So I would just advise the students that focus on the technique and maybe within the limited time that you play, do not waste your time just by playing the things that you can play, but just devote your time to playing the things that you cannot play. Mm. that you cannot play like yeah. where you are faltering where you are getting stuck and maybe you take up portions don't try to play everything at a time <laughs> maybe you have 10 drilling exercises so for today i just have 30 minutes time now let me just choose these five drilling exercises mm-hmm. paltas maybe or bowls and for 30 minutes i'm just going to drill them yeah. so part by part So if someone tries to do everything within a short time, it's not possible. So he or she must compartmentalize the lesson. And Mm. in this way, in the span of a week, regularity is very important. Like he has to be very disciplined and he should sit with his instrument at a fixed hour because that gets into a habit like sleeping or having your lunch you know mm-hmm. there should be a fixed time if it's dawn if you can get up early very good because everything around you is calm and quiet and then you know you just freshen up and you take your instrument and practice for the rest of the day you are done you know <laughs> that yes i have i have today i have touched my instrument yeah. and i have done the practice for myself, like I go out to work so in the morning when I can practice, I get up very early. So after I have practiced, no, I feel very relaxed. Okay, at least for the day, my practice is done. Then when I come back and I have more time, that's practice again. But at least you must touch your instrument, make it a habit every day. Mm. You have to touch your instrument and do those drilling 
like choose and plan part by part and do the drilling. Weekends, practice more. Practice more if you have a vacation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you really want to be a good musician, you need to sacrifice a lot of things in your life. Like if you think that I'm just going and I'm going to have a, like a chat with my friends in the coffee shop, or maybe I just want to go and just my spend my time with my girlfriend here and there. So no, then that's, you cannot be a good musician that way. You have to make a sacrifice, like just focus your time. Whatever time you think you are just going to while away, you are just going to relax, focus it on music. You need yeah. a lot of, you just can't like, I, I can't go and I can't sit in front of the television and I don't know what soaps and cereals are going on. <laughs> I really don't know. I have very few friends I hang out with. Yeah. Okay, so maybe it's once in a while. My friends, you know, like nowadays we have all these school groups, all the, like those friends in my school, we have groups here in India. So they have a get together. Very often they ask me, Amita, why, why are you not joining us? So I just find a lame excuse. Oh, today I'm not feeling well. Oh, 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 no, no, no. Today I my Jawari is not done. You know, I have to go to the, he has asked me to come. Yes. And you know, I have just missed five get to Togethers this way, and if they listen to this interview, they are just going to hang me. See, Meeta has lied to us. <laughs> I just find a lame excuse for not joining them. Yes. Of course, I keep touch with them, and once in a while, maybe I'll meet them. Of course, not yeah. regularly. <laughs> Some balance, maybe after but... the, the yes, maybe once in a while, maybe after five or six get-togethers, I'll go and meet them sometimes. <laughs> so it's just like that. We touched a little bit on on social media and how that sort of changed the landscape for for students and and what people sort of expect. Um, I would I was sort of curious. How do you feel like that that has changed, or or maybe just even, you know, how concerts have changed? Is there do you feel in this in this current environment a pressure to, you know show that you can perform as many different ragas as you can in a, in a concert or that you need to have constantly something new and different all the time, as opposed to focusing on um, perfection in maybe one area. Yes. As, as for myself, like I'm not really uh, eager to show how many different ragas I can play. Mm -hmm. But the pressure of the social media, of course, it's it's very big nowadays, but it also yeah. ha has its advantages. Like today we can reach out to any corner of the globe. So sitting here in Kolkata, maybe somebody somebody just on the other side of the globe is reaching me like now you are reaching like, me like right so here <laughs> yes and also if somebody wants to learn it it has become very easy now to learn on, online yeah so this the, the 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 net the internet has a lot of advantages no doubt but along with that like every day millions and millions of new data are pouring in so it's very difficult to keep track of everything so yeah. now today if i decide that i'm going to listen to every new uploads that are being made on the youtube then i just stop practicing i have no time for myself because it takes you can it consumes a lot of time oh, yeah. if you just keep on listening to so so like maybe infinite amount of material that is there on the web nowadays yeah you have to just listen limitedly and you can't listen to all or you can't watch everything that's impossible yeah. so just you pick and choose but if someone asks me what i shall focus on on the social media i should say nowadays Time for performance on the stage has got very limited. Mm. Unlike the previous years when the artists got two hours, two and a half hours to play their yeah. solo concerts. Now the time is very limited. So I have to squeeze my recital. It's not possible for me to explore all the infinite routes the infinite possibilities or to open up a rug. Like if I want to play uh, 50 minutes or one hour alap, I can't do that. But mm. Rupert alap actually has 
Like it has so many phases and there are so many things to explore. So I am focusing on that part of my recital, which I really can't demonstrate on the stage. And the audience, the nature of the audience has also changed. Today's yeah. audience has become much more intelligent in, in, in the way that they are very, very technically virtuous. Hmm. The technical virtuosity is there, but the depth, that meditative approach is going down because yeah. people, they, you know, they, they are just, it, it's a very, very speedy world and people are going through a lot of stress and strain in their everyday life. So they really don't have the time to sit and listen in a very, in, in a meditative way to what you're playing. They would like a very, something very short and exciting, energetic performance and done. Yeah, they there's would a just lot of that. leave the hall. I feel that somewhere there is a hunger within all of us. We somewhere, I feel that restlessness needs to be calmed down. A time will come. All these people at a certain age, they will realize that they have been running through life. They have been running through life and they'll get tired of running. So there will come a time when they would just like to sit and relax and expand their minds. Mm. That is where the Indian music comes in. It gives you peace. It gives you that spiritual joy. It gives you a sense of tremendous release, relaxation yeah. from your stresses and it soothes your nerves. So that is, I, I'm focusing actually on this aspect of the rag. Maybe today I have played Yemen. A few months later, I'll try to look at Raga Yemen from a very different perspective. Mm. And I will try to play it from a different approach. Mm. Even when I'm playing with a tabla, every time the approach should be changing. I can take up different kinds of uh, like rhythms, different experimentations with the rhythms. My interaction can differ every time. It's like a conversation. So it changes. Yeah. It cannot be the same, the stereotype every time. It's not something learned by heart. I'm sitting with so many different tabla players. Each have their different approaches. So communicating with them, I'll also try like the interaction Two voices, the voice of the sitar, the voice of the tabla, two different people, they are talking to each other. The expression needs to change every time I'm performing. Yeah, yeah. I love that, um, you know, you've, you've begun posting these longer performances on your YouTube channel because I feel like it's so common now to get short clips everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And and everyone be like, look at how fast I can play or look at this. Or, and it's, and and yes. sometimes I, as a, especially as a student, like I would much rather listen to a, a really long developed version of, uh, you know, Rag Yemen and go like, okay, it's, I can like digest this a bit and have time to live in it. And then to go listen to the exact same rag performed by someone else and say like okay how are they telling me that same story you know and um i think that one of the things i'm just i'm so excited about now that you have your youtube channel and you've been posting is just to listen to what i like to think are un uninterrupted performances that you hopefully don't feel constrained by you know okay you have 30 minutes to perform at this, you know, concert somewhere, you can make it as long or as short as you would like. And, and that's something that um, I'm very excited about, you know, to, and so thank yeah, you for sort I've, of sharing those with us. I'm also just, I'm sorry, just to interrupt. One thing is that the modern generation, I just feel that the modern generation, you know, all the musicians, whether they are vocalists or instrumentalists, they are just vying with one another, just trying to show who is technically more virtuous than the other. <laughs> and they are just running behind tremendous speed. They are so crazy about speed. And also like, they are also trying to, 
prove their competence, like mm -hmm. with the rhythm. Like, yeah. okay, I'm very calculative. I'm very perfect in calculation. But I think in all that, the essence of Indian music is getting lost. Mm. Because Indian music is not all about speed. Of course, I admired the technical point of view. Compared to the earlier ages, the modern age is technically much, much more advanced and perfect. And also the acoustics, it's much improved acoustics that we have yeah. now. But regarding the soul of the music, you know, I am just hoping that the future generation, they try to look into the soul of music, the essence of the rag, the joy of listening to the rag, not only the technical side of it, but the rag is like a character. It has its own personality. So every rag is a person. Yeah. So that has to be explored. And every raga has a voice. That needs to be explored. And also the compositions, you know, they can be so varied. Like it's not just one or two guts that I can play in a certain raga. Improvisation allows you every time to come up with new, new compositions. It's not that you just have to play a bandish, which someone has written or someone has sung, and you are just playing mechanically that bandish. It's not a mechanical repetition of what some master has played but you can compose this is also where my gharana comes in you know we really don't have in the sense like bandishes like we don't really play well my guru has played this note exactly after this note i should play like that no we are not like that we actually have a kind of skeleton the structure hmm. so we have a structure which is defined by the right hand syllabus the bowls and right. you are taught to play a certain raga. You know the, how to develop the raga. Now you have every liberty every time to have your own compositions within that framework. So it's uh, not exactly uh, note by note what my father has taught me that I have to play. Of course, we have some basic compositions. And when our learners come, we always teach those traditional course, basic yeah. compositions to our students. At the same time, like when they are advanced learners, we teach them how to deviate from the composition and how they can create their own compositions within the given framework. This is very important to allow the musician, the, allow the learner to think for himself. Mm. Improvisation, how to improvise, because the soul of Indian music is not just being a copycat or just playing fast, but it's playing with spontaneity and it's improvisational music. Improvisation mm. plays the leading role in our music. For me, when I listen to you, it's like, it sounds like perfection, right? <laughs> but I'm imagining that at your skill level, you only get there by being self-critical, right? And, and looking for areas to improve and say, Hmm. where am I strong? Where am I weak? And how do I get better hmm. at where I'm weak? What are those areas for you now that you go like, oh, this is what I want to work on. And how has that changed over time from when you were, let's say in your teens or your twenties or out of college. And as you've grown as an artist, are mm -hmm. those sort of the same things or have they morphed over time? No, but what I think that compared to the technical virtuosity of the present generation, like they are, more particular about the sound, the Jawari part, mm. and now also the design of the sitar, you know, they are just carving the sitars in a way, like there's a kind of amalg amalgamation between the uh, Vilayat Khan style sitar and the Mayhar style sitar, like they are trying to make this, the, 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 this, yes, wider, yeah, yeah. the dandi, they the are dandi, trying to yeah. make wider so that they can play very long mirrors, you know, and they are carving yeah. the sitar and they're also changing their instruments after a certain time. But I never try to change my instrument. Rather, I am trying to adapt myself 
with my instrument in such a way, I'm just trying to make some adjustments in the bridge. And also I just lowered the pitch from perfect D to between C sharp and D, where okay. I noticed that I can play like longer mirrors. Sure. Because with my strength, and my hand, of course, it's a woman's hand. It's not as strong as a man's. I'm so sure I find it's stronger now, than mine. <laughs> so I can now play the mirrors at ease. So I'm also focusing on my technical imperfections. Mm -hmm. And acoustically, I have to be more perfect. This is something especially, you know, growing and playing with my father, like who whose prime time began in 1960s. Mm. At that time, you just had all those, the sound was very simple. You had the microphone and you had the big loud speakers. You didn't have all these pickups and all the mm -hmm. uh, so sophisticated sound systems. You didn't have them all the, so, I was used to playing with a certain volume and strength. But now when you have the very sophisticated sound devices, yeah. you have to learn to control your finger movement mm. and learn to control your volume. So this is something I have to be very careful about. And yeah. the other thing is going into the depth of the raga. Like I find that when I was younger, I had a vision of the raga, but now with time, I am growing more inward and more calm. So also my vision of the raga mm. is changing. And now I can think when I close my eyes, I can see so many routes, so many more avenues to exploring the ragas. And every time when I'm performing, sometimes new concepts, you know, come up and I try to just experiment with those new concepts, some new techniques, some new bowl. So it's there. Also in my interaction with the tabla, you know, there should be a deeper interaction between the tabla and the instrument. Mm. Like I play like what I have learned. The tabla plays what he has learned, the compositions. It's not that compartmentalized thing, mm. but like sometimes there should be a conversation and there should be a kind of like the conversation is overlapping. Yeah. Like it mm. happens. Like I'm interfering in your speech. So we say sat sangat, like going together. The sitar and the tabla, like they are playing together. The sat sangat now, it's very interesting. Yeah. And it it you know it, the it picks up a lot of energy when you calculate the rhythm in your mind and you play the sat sangat and you come to the first beat together. It's mm. a mental calculation going and what he's playing, I'm just trying to play along with him. What I'm playing, he's trying to play along with me. And in that way, it's it, it's a very, very exciting kind of a game. It's being very playful when you are playing. Yeah, yeah. It's like a it's it's like a uh what it's like a drama. It's very much like a drama. So in a drama, you have conflicts also so also there we should build up that drama like there is harmony there is also conflict yeah and together it builds up that like whole personality it builds up the life the drama of life oh, this so is, this music is should have that drama also it should have its harmony and conflicts and to give it should be full of life well mitaji this has been just fantastic. I, I, this is, I'm so like glowing with like joy having had this conversation with you. So th I really want to thank you very much. Um, I, if I seem like I'm rushing, it's because I'm nervous that I'm going to run out of recording space. <laughs> and, yes. And yes. so I want to just very, uh, quickly before I do run out of recording space, please, um, Feel free to promote any anything that you have going on currently so that my, I know you have this new YouTube channel. Um, obviously, you teach. Uh, but if there's anything that or, or, you know you want to mention, please feel free to do so. Yes, I shall. I'm also like uh, planning some new projects regarding teaching, you know, short clips. And if like anybody who is inquisitive to learn, like just very short clips, how to practice. So I'm just planning these projects. I and I it. hope that, uh, yes, not much before long, I'll be able to come up gradually with all these new videos. 
once more. Well, I will certainly be there to watch as, as these as this develops and and um I want to thank you again for for this conversation. You know, I like I said before when I was just starting to learn the sitar and I was going on YouTube trying to find videos just to you know listen and and you were one of the very first um things that I saw um and I was like this is I was just like oh that was just like just so it connected in a way right and and so to to now be here all these years later I don't know like eight ten years whatever it is later it's I'm also so happy to be talking with you and I have really enjoyed this uh, session talking about my gharana, my music, my thoughts about music. And I think I'm not just talking to you, but I'm also interacting at the same time with all the music lovers. And yes. uh, it's a special privilege. I'm really honored. I'm so happy just to be a part of uh, like your interview series. And I look forward to more like communicating to you further in future. Okay, yes, thank you well, again so much for inviting me. Thanks a lot. Thank for you. Thank you very much. Me. I'm going to uh, I'm going to wave goodbye for now. Oh, and I have to ask a quick, super short, fun question before I forget. Um, do you like ice cream? Of course, okay. I do like ice cream. <laughs> I I especially don't take ice cream in summer season. I mm. take it in winter season. Okay, all right. Because I've, the outer climate, you know, matches. Yes. Then. Okay. I was going. I was gonna to ask upon that. Do you have a favorite flavor? Butterscotch. Ooh, I love butterscotch. In fact, before this interview. I had a quick butterscotch candy because I was worried I was going to dry mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I should just finally say, Indian music, the tradition, shall live on for generations. Excellent. And it will thrill the audience all around the globe. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Thank you once again. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please leave comments. I will have links to uh, Mita G's uh, YouTube channel and her web website and all the ways to contact uh, to be able to find her. Thank you once again. Bye-bye for now. Thank you and namaskar.